Well, hey, good morning, Rosebank. Or should I say, good morning again, since we've already said good morning via the screen. I feel like you've already seen enough of me this morning. I just can't seem to get away from those cameras. They are following me everywhere. But this is far better, right? Um, it's far better to talk in person. Also, not a huge fan of talking about masks. Way rather be talking about the Bible. So that's what we're getting to this morning. So today, if you're joining us for the first time, we are finishing up a little series that we've been doing for the last five or six weeks, uh, journeying through some of the one another statements in the Bible. Now, the reason we've been doing that is quite simply to remind ourselves of the necessity of real, uh, I suppose, embodied Christian community. There are over 100 statements that say one another, this one another, that one another, and what those, the cumulative effect of 100 one another statements, what that means is, as a Christian, whilst yes, it's true that you are saved individually, meaning God in Jesus through the Holy Spirit comes to you personally and reaches into your heart. It's a very personal, individual uh, thing that happens. While you are saved individually, you are saved into community. And it is only in community, in church, in these kinds of relationships that we flourish. So I often kind of ask congregations this question uh, to kind of test our understanding here. Is it possible to be saved, to be a Christian, right, to be saved and not go to church? Yes or no? Not a trick question? Yes, yes. Yes, it is because salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Amen. And we got that part down. That, we've got to be clear about that. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. It's possible to be saved and not go to church. Yes. Second question. Is it possible to flourish as a Christian and not be in Christian community or not go to church? No. no hey, way better. So I kind of helps you out a little bit there with that one. Abs the Bible has no, has no language for that. Just our 100, one another statements, how they build us up, all of these things we've been discussing, it's just not possible to flourish, kind of reach the purposes that God has for you to grow in the way that he intends for you to grow, to protect you, to stand by you through life's challenges. God has made it that way that we stand by each other. It's just, it's not possible to flourish as a Christian without one another. So today we're going to close out that series and look at a particularly challenging one another statement. Um, challenging in many ways, but challenging also because it's something that we would tend to think is actually, well, this one's personal. This one's between me and God. This is not a community kind of idea, but you're going to see today that it comes up not as an individual pursuit, but actually part of community, one another. So turn to James chapter 5, and uh, we're reading this morning from verses 13 to 18. James chapter 5, verse 13 to 18. And it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Anybody? Is anyone among you suffering? Let him or her, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Anybody? One, two people. Let them sing praise. It's a solo, apparently, this morning. <laughs> let them sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 
Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it didn't rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. An incredible passage, quite obviously, about the power of prayer. Now, it's not uncommon for New Testament writers to close off their letters, like James is closing his letter. It's not uncommon to close off reminding us to pray, which is something on its own. But James gives the subject of prayer a lot more time and a lot more detail than any other New Testament author. If you go look through those six verses or so, prayer appears on every single line. And it's interesting to note that here, prayer is not limited to a pers- an individual pursuit, to something just between God and me. God and I, yeah, right? And, and that we would think, well, I know that's really a lot more personal. And, and yes, there is the individual aspect of prayer here. Is anyone suffering? Let them pray. But also there is, if anyone's sick, let them call other people to pray for them and pray for one another. So even prayer, which is the most basic, personal, individual act of relating to God is also a one another. But that's not even the most interesting one another here because we do kind of know that. Don't we pray? We pray together. We do that in services. We do that on last Wednesdays of the month. So we kind of know that. The other one another here is far more surprising that it appears as a community action. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Am I right in thinking that generally we would have thought that the issue of my sinfulness, that's between God and I, that's individual. That is not a community event, that's what you would think. Yet here, confessing your sins is a one another statement. It's fascinating and that's what we're gonna explore today. Before we get there, though, I think we have to take some time to just try to understand why James is including the subject of confessing sins to one another quite clearly while he's talking about prayer and talking about prayer for healing from sickness. You've got to really see this. This confess your sins comes sandwiched between these powerful instructions on prayer. And if you read the flow of sick and pray for sick, confess your sins, therefore you may be healed, it seems that what James is saying is that sometimes, sometimes it would not be enough to only pray for healing. Sometimes it seems you would need to be confessing sins as well as praying for healing. It seems as though to James there is sometimes a connection between physical sickness and suffering and sin. That's the way he's talking about this. And I think we've got to explore that. We've got to understand this, right? Because does that mean that if you are sick or if you are suffering, that it is because of some particular sin in your life? You've got to try and understand this. So let me ask, does all sickness come from sin. No, all right, this is why I love reading with people there. Some say no, some nodding their heads. Answer, yes and no. Yes, <laughs> so I'm just tricking you this morning, just like, hey, you know, enjoying the interaction here. Yes, in a general sense, because there would not be any sickness on the earth if it were not for sin in the first place. In the beginning of the Bible, Adam and Eve are living in perfect relationship with God. There was no sickness. And when man first fell, first disobeyed God and sin entered the world and entered humanity, then sickness arose. And one day, in eternity, 
in the new creation, in the perfect new world, in our new bodies, you know, all of that gives us such great hope. Will there be sickness in that space, in eternity? Absolutely not. No sickness, no suffering, no crying. It's all perfect. So generally speaking, yes, all sickness is a result of sin. But those of you who said no correctly, not all of our particular sickness is because of some particular sin in our lives. And you knew that because you know great stories in the Bible that illustrate this. For example, Job. Job's the guy who suffered more, including physical sickness, perhaps more than any other person. And all his friends thought, yeah, it's because you sinned, man. But we all know the story that had nothing to do with that. And we know stories like the Apostle Paul, who had this mysterious thorn in his flesh, a literal, debilitating, painful sickness that he prayed to God to take away. And there's that great verse, my, power, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. In fact, God explained to him the reason he was experiencing that physical pain is not because of sin, but to prevent the sin of pride coming. We know stories like that. We know stories like John chapter 9, where the disciples of Jesus come across a man who's been blind from birth. And they go, hey, Jesus, tell us. I think they're trying to catch him out here. Like, oh, this is a good one. Hey, Jesus, tell us, was it because of this guy's sin? But he was blind from birth, so. Or was it his parents' sin? And what does Jesus say? Neither. But it was so that the works of God could be displayed in him. And so that's why we know, yeah, no, not all Particular sickness or my particular suffering right now is because of particular sin. But here's what we have to face up to this morning. But sometimes, sometimes particular sickness, particular suffering is because of particular sin. Because that's James 5. You, you can't see around that in James 5. And it is elsewhere in the Bible too. For example, Mark chapter 2. That wonderful story of Jesus at this house and he's teaching people and he's healing all sorts of sick and the, these friends have this friend who's been paralyzed. You know that story? And they can't get to Jesus, too many people, so they dig through the roof and they let their friend down right in front of Jesus. How does Jesus respond? So the Bible says that seeing their faith, he responded. What did he say to the paralyzed man? Anyone remember? His first words are, your sins are forgiven. Now that is unexpected. The whole story is unexpected. The roof is open. It's like all crazy. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. That's like going to the doctor. Like, doctor, I'm really, really sick. Mm, you know, testing, your heart rate, like all of that stuff. You're forgiven. You can go. What? It's entirely unexpected that Jesus would say your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees murmur about this, mainly because they're like, who's this guy that he thinks he can forgive sin? They forget like how weird this is that the guy's sick and Jesus didn't say, be healed. He said, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus addresses them and he says to them, for which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? So in that instance, it seems that there was a very necessary element of forgiveness that needed to be applied for the healing to happen. So we see this in the Bible, not all the time, but we do see it. And I think the reason we need to pause and take stock of this is simply because we should never, ever underestimate just how connected our physical and spiritual lives are. See, we tend to do that. We tend to compartmentalize things, but the Bible doesn't talk about humanity like that. When Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, he's not really looking at different compartments. I mean, you go through them, heart, okay, what is that? Maybe that's like my feelings, okay. You know, mind, that's my thinking, okay. Like strength, that's my serving, like soul, like what is that? But when he said that, he, he was talking about give air, love God with everything. It wasn't meant to be this exercise of neatly dividing up your life. He was saying, hey, all of it, every faculty of your being is one, should be in worship. This is how the Bible talks about 
the connection between our physical and our spiritual, generally speaking, but also specifically speaking, the reason we need to pause is also to remind ourselves to not underestimate the weight of sin and how destructive it is. We know, if you gather here this morning, just presuming, because you're booked to come to church and it's a miserable day and you're here anyway and masks and the whole deal, so you know probably that primarily that weight of sin you know, it destroys our relationship with God. We also know how it affects our relationships with each other, but don't underestimate the weight and the power of sin. It has all sorts of consequences. And in this passage this morning, when it comes to confessing sins, the whole point is because secret, unconfessed brokenness and sinfulness in our lives has all sorts of devastating consequences, including physical. I've shared with you before uh, Psalm 32 fascinating verse 3 and 4 it says for when I kept silent about my sin when I kept silent my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long it's talking physical torment for day and night your hand was heavy on me it's like this weight bearing on me my strength was dried up like the summer like it's talking about this physical response to the weight of unconfessed sinfulness if you think about it, it, it makes sense when you start thinking about human beings and how connected we actually are. And the secret, unconfessed, these hidden dark places of brokenness and shame and guilt. How at the very least, on like a physiological level, the anxiety of it, the guilt of it keeps us up at night and we don't sleep so well. And then there's also like the stress response. We know all that stuff. So James, in this passage, Recognizing this connection says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Because sometimes praying for healing goes hand in hand with confessing sin. And sometimes, let me say this, sometimes Staggering, supernatural healing comes from sin being confessed. Now, I want to just kind of put a little disclaimer here. That does not mean that the right response now is if you're sick, or you probably not, because you shouldn't be here, you're not allowed here if you're sick. If someone else close to you is sick and maybe terminally sick and you're really struggling with it, that you need to now go like, hey, what's your sin, you know? And go into this deep, dark dive to try and come up with something. When James says, confess your sins, the idea is it's already there. You know what it is. It's not some introspective journey to find something. It's No, it's there. You know what it is. Now let it out into the light. And confess your sins. And hey, let me just say this. One last thing before we get into the actual, what it means to confess one another. Hey, even if there's not a connection between your physical circumstances and sin, it's just never a bad idea <laughs> to be letting sin out. And so you literally have nothing to lose from it. Amen? Does make sense? So now that we're on the subject of confession, let's really get into it. What does it mean? Why, more importantly, why would we do this really uncomfortable, awkward thing of confessing our sins to one another? So, it's really interesting about this idea of confess. The moment I started talking about it, you're all thinking, yes, yeah, sin is this dark and it's this uncomfortable, you know, shameful, really awkward thing to do. But in the Bible, the word confess is used in a couple of different ways. And what it literally means, confess literally means is this, to declare what is true about you. To declare what's true about you. So it's not always used in a negative sense. It is sometimes used as a word for, get this, praise. 
Because Prey is also declaring what's true about you. Your affection for Jesus and your loyalty for Jesus, that's used as the word confess is used in that instance. Let me give you an example. Philippians 2 verse 11 says, so that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven. I don't know, this is a powerful verse. And under the earth, who's that? I don't know. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. You've heard that, right? Confess, you just never thought about it as the same confession because when we think confession, we think about digging up some deep, dark, depressing sin and confessing it in a shadowy booth to somebody. And understanding, at essence, what confess means is simply declaring what's true about you is really helpful, at the very least, in framing this conversation in rescuing it from being just this depressing subject. But it's also actually really helpful in just us understanding what it means or how to practice it. Because at its heart, confessing is simply telling somebody, another Christian, the truth about yourself. And so quite simply what it could mean is going up to another Christian and going, hey man, tell me what's true about you. Do you get that? That is a powerful question. It's a powerful question that Christians should ask each other. In relationship, hey, what's true about you right now? And here's the thing, if things are going really well, Someone says, yeah, hey, what's true about you? You, go, you know what's true is I'm experiencing the grace of God in remarkable ways. Tell them that. See, that's confessing, but it's confessing the truth about you that's not just the dark stuff. But it obviously, because we're fallen human beings, will include the things that we are struggling with. What's true about you? I feel like we need to say that to each other a lot more to one another that's important here confess your sins to one another not to some special person not to just a pastor or a priest one another which of course is super awkward so let's deal with that why would we do this why would we go through this really uncomfortable conversation of sharing with someone what we're going through so I want to spend some time here because the Bible tells us this because it is a critical means or tool in overcoming our sinfulness. So he has a few reasons why you would want to do this. Number one, because confessing, speaking out, declaring the truth about our particular sin in detail attacks the power, attacks the power of sin over us. Here's what I mean, on a very simple level, a large portion of the power of sin is its secrecy. Habitual, repetitive, especially kind of addictive sins thrive in secrecy, in anonymity. Thrives, it grows, it gets strength from secrecy. The moment it is no longer a secret, it immediately loses some of its power over us. Because sin thrives in secrecy. Which is why these days, so the digital age, like we need to talk about the effects of the digital age, and obviously we're not against any form of technology because, hey, right now there are bunches of people watching church on their TVs. But there are some incredible dangers, particularly when it comes to the area of some of our deepest, darkest, habitual sins. Like, just to be blunt with you, in days of old, if one wanted to procure certain material of a certain nature, One had to go to a certain store and purchase. There was a transaction involved and school kids on a playground had to gather around said material. I will not say any much more. 
there was a certain element to it which could not be hidden. But these days, pornography thrives, particularly now, because it's anonymous. Because there is anonymity. That's why it has grown so much. Because these kinds of sins thrive in secrecy. And when you confess, when you bring them into the open, you break the power of secrecy. Listen, don't underestimate just this if you're struggling with things in your life. I'm not saying it's like the silver bullet, but man, I've experienced it. It goes a long, long way in dealing with the power of particular sins in our lives. Which is also, by the way, why it needs to be one another and not just between God and I. Because we do that as Christians. We'll come to God with our deepest stuff sometimes, but it's still a secret. And you're confessing to Him, and He knows, and that's beautiful and necessary, but it's still a secret. The moment you tell another human being, it's not a secret anymore. And it loses some of that power. So that's one reason, very good reason. Second reason, because it reduces the shame associated with sin. This one's a little complicated because shame is so complicated. But how I think about it is shame is primarily relationally associated. Shame is something we experience. It's got to do with how people think of me because I've done this. So when it's just a secret, in my mind, and I'm not a psychologist, so I may be wrong here, but in my mind, it's not so much shame that I'm experiencing, but the potential for shame. The potential, if this gets out, if I lift the lid on this, then shame, once it's exposed, then it becomes full-blown shame, and I don't want that. So shame is necessarily relationally orientated, but that is exactly why it's got to come up relationally, and that's why the Bible says, do this with one another, as in another Christian has to be another Christian, because it is the other Christian, a gospel-centered Christian, who when hearing this, when you've lifted the lid on your potential shame, and it's out in the open, they apply the gospel of Jesus Christ. They remind you, you've been forgiven. They remind you Christ died on a cross, especially for that, they remind Mind you that there is forgiveness and healing, and as the lift is lifted, as the lid is lifted, as the lift is lit off, and this thing pops out, it actually dissipates right away. When you're with another Christian, so it's counterintuitive. I don't want to let this out because then it becomes shame. But when you do it with a Christian, he brings the gospel back to you. It dissipates. Third reason why you would want to do that is because it counters the fear associated with sin. There is fear associated with sin. If you're living, and when I've lived with this kind of sin state, make no mistake, what you're experiencing, part of it is fear. Which is also why there are physical consequences when you live in this constant state of fear. And here's the fear. It's anxiety over Potential exposure. So when it's down there in the dark, there's anxiety that someone's going to find out. And the thing is, as Christians, there's this latent anxiety, not just because you're worried someone's going to find out, but because you know God already knows. Which means, just by the way, there's no such thing as anonymity. God already knows. And as a Christian, you also know verses like Luke 8 that one day it will all be exposed for nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest. Nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. And so what we can't put our finger on when we're caught in something and it's anxiety and fear is this fear of exposure and the fact that God already knows and that it's going to be manifest in some way. And here's the thing. When we confess, immediately all of that pressure falls away because now somebody does know. 
and they've loved you in return. And that fear and that anxiety disappears right away. Last reason. Do you need another reason? I feel like we've got enough. Or you had me at one. That's what you're thinking, right? Well, we've got some more time. So here's number four. Pave the way for restoration from sin. Because ultimately, we don't just want to be forgiven. We want to be restored. Sin is broken relationship between me and God. And we want, to, want to, be, to be restored. And between people, we want it to be restored. And when you confess with another human being, generally speaking, you can't hide the details. And this is important. Confession means bringing the detail. Because another Christian will ask enough about, they won't let you hanging it. You know, if there's something going on in my life. I'll go, what? You know what I mean? Which is necessary for, for restoration. Because here's what we do again as Christians, generally speaking, is we might be willing to, in this general sense, say, yeah, man, I'm a, I'm a sinner, which is an important thing that we just always know. And there's grace. Like, that's life. That's Christian life, grace. And that's good, but that's not enough to bring restoration. For example, when has it ever hurt if you've been in an argument with a friend or a spouse and maybe the argument's built and built and like there's, now there's been time. You know that friend that you haven't spoken to like in a long, long time and then eventually you're like, man, I'm so tired of this and you send them a message. Whatever I've done to hurt you, I'm sorry. Anyone tried that? No, confessing your sins. Thank you. See, people are getting that this morning. We've all done it. Whatever I've done to hurt you, I'm sorry. Listen, when has that ever worked? Ever. Let's just be honest. Whatever I've done, I'm sorry. It's never worked because it's got to be particular. It only works when we say, hey, I realized that day I said this, I did that. Like, am I right? That's when restoration happens. And we kind of do this with God all the time, you know, generally, but with a person sitting, interrogating us, which is what they should be doing, this comes out and restoration can happen. So, when we look at all these reasons, is it any wonder that you find Jesus in his time on earth walking and interacting with people? Is it any surprise that this is what he's constantly doing, drawing people's darkness out of them. For example, last story, and then we'll, we'll close. Famous story of the Samaritan woman. Jesus is journeying, he decides to go through Samaria, whole cool story there, stops at a well, he's thirsty. No, he's not. You know, he went 40 days without it, but he stops at this well, it's Jacob's well, that's super cool, and he's thirsty, there's a woman there, and he asks her for a drink of water, that exchange is amazing in so many different ways, the things they talk about, and living water, and worship, and this whole thing, but at one point, Jesus says to her, out of the blue, hey, why don't you go get your husband? You know that part of the story? And she says, I don't have a husband, and Jesus says, yes, I know, you've had five husbands, and you're currently in an adulterous relationship. So he knew that about her. You would think that's insensitive. Wow, well, they're having a fabulous conversation. It's really spiritual. It's wonderful. Was well, she worshiping spirit and truth? You were gone with that all day. Why ruin the moment by bringing up this awkward thing? But that's what Jesus does. He draws out the particular hurt, brokenness. And so he tells her the story and it carries on as this wonderful exchange but don't miss the kicker of the story here after this incredibly awkward uncomfortable part of the conversation that leads to confession and in the context living water it's beautiful this is what happens verse 39 John 4 where the story happens many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony which was, he told me all that I ever did. He knows everything I ever did. And because of this, it was so amazing to her that this darkness was exposed and brought to the light in the context of living water and healing. She went and shared, revival broke out. That's what happens. I mean, corporately, yes. But personally, that's the power of it coming out into the open, into the light. And corporately, if you track revivals in history, the real genuine moments in time when God transformed countries, revivals were always marked by 
repentance, a knowledge of sinfulness, a confession of it, and a new holiness coming out. Like, that's how powerful this is. So don't underestimate. It's such a simple, it's just one line. Don't underestimate the power of confession to bring healing in way more ways than one, to bring revival in your life, family, or the social spaces you're in. Find somebody to tell the truth about yourself to. And I'm gonna pray now and then we're gonna, we're gonna take some time to corporately confess our sins together. Now let me just say, whoa, whoa, whoa. That does not mean open mark, come up one by one. Tell him, we're not gonna do that. But I want to do something a little, a little different. We tried it at, a, at a one of our Wednesday night prayer meetings. Something we don't often do as a church, corporately confessing our sinfulness. Well, we do it like communion. That's really what we're saying. Hey, we're sinners, but it's general. I wanna do this in a way where we together, embodied people gathered around, can all say, hey, we're broken. We have particular sinfulness in our lives. And we can look around and go, yeah, we all look perfect, but we all know we're not. And we can all apply the gospel together. So I'm gonna lead us in that. It's gonna take the form of a kind of a liturgy. So I say something and you respond. Again, disclaimer, don't worry. I'm not trying to turn us into an Anglican church or something like that. Not that that would be bad, just saying. But let's try this. So I'm gonna just pray for us generally. And then I'm gonna ask you after that, after I've prayed to, um, to, to stand and kind of do this response together. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that we can boldly approach your throne, the throne of grace, and receive mercy and receive grace when we need help. And we don't know why we don't do this, what stops us from doing this. What we do, it's our pride. And we ask you together as a family, help us Holy Spirit, just bring conviction where there are these areas and help us find that one person that we can tell the truth about ourselves to. Help us find that person. Or a couple of people. Lord, lead us on this journey. For your name's sake, but also we just acknowledge for our sake, because we're broken, because we're hurting, because we're feeling the effects of our sinfulness. Help us to find healing. And we know that we can confidently Bear all that we are with truth in front of you, Lord Jesus, because you love us just as we are. And you demonstrated your love for us, Heavenly Father, and that while we were sinners, you came to earth in the form of man and suffered and died in our place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And now we boldly approach your throne of grace. Amen. So please will you stand? And this little liturgy that I came across thought was really beautiful because it's just based on the Sermon of the Mount. So Matthew chapter five is Jesus, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know that passage? And it just takes that passage and goes, hang on, have we done this? Have we done this? And so there's a, a line, you can bring up the, the first so long, thanks Christine. Um, so there's like, I'll make a statement and it's straight from these Beatitudes, and then you respond, and I'll respond with you. I'm, I'm in this, obviously. Uh, loud, the, the next part, which just identifies, hey, yo, we, we haven't lived up to this. And what I love about this is it's general, but as you go through these Beatitudes, you'll see, you'll go, yo, that is me. No one's gonna make it out of this going, no, I'm not, I'm, there's nothing for me. Like, it's a warning. You're not gonna make it out of this one alive. Well, you know what I mean, alive, but. You're going to find just specifics about your life in this. But we're going to say it together because as we look around the room, we all are like this. So let's try. So let me start and then you reply. So blessed Jesus, you offered us all your blessings when you announced blessed are the poor in spirit. But we have been rich in pride. 
Blessed are those who mourn, Jesus says. Not known much sorrow for us. Blessed are the meek, but we are stiff-necked people. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, but we are filled to the full with other things. Blessed are the merciful, but we are harsh and impatient. I told you you wouldn't make it out of this. Oh, Blessed are the pure in heart, but we have impure hearts. Blessed are the peacemakers, but we have not sought reconciliation. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, but our lives do not even challenge the world. Blessed are you, Jesus says, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And we've hardly made it known that we are yours. And so it goes on to say, your law is holy, your commandments perfect, but they're too great for us. You alone are the perfect one, and so we say, we plead with you to forgive our sins and give us the blessing of your righteousness. And church, you can know that you have the blessing of the righteousness of Jesus given to you through faith in him and in his work on a cross. Amen? And so we know, you can look at the cross and right now receive forgiveness for all of those things. So let's continue. You can stay standing, I think, as the worship team come up. And lead us as we continue to worship together.